Hey there, and welcome to the Listening Circle of the Schubert Club. The Listening Circle is a monthly gathering for people who are interested in learning about, listening to, and discussing music in a new way outside of the concert hall. My name is Mark Bilyeu, and this is part two of our installment exploring the commissions of the Schubert Club. I'm grateful to those composers who have joined me in introducing their works in parts one and part two, and I'm really looking forward to sharing with you my favorite Minnesota music story of when Dominic Argento won his Pulitzer Prize. Let's just jump right in. In part one, we discussed in detail about the what and the why of commissioning new music, so I'd encourage you to go back for a quick review in case you missed it. For our purposes today, we'll refer back to the definition given to us by the American Composers Forum in St. Paul, who says commissioning is paying composers to write a new piece for a specific purpose or event. We begin every listening circle with a reminder of what we can be listening for. Here are some aspects and qualities all music possesses to some degree. You might want to jot a couple of these down or take a screenshot of the list so you can more actively listen going forward. What are we listening for? Loudness and softness, changes and transformations, a recognition of something heard earlier, different speeds are called tempo, different instrument sounds are called the timbre of the instrument, melodies, rhythms, and patterns, terrific performing called virtuosity, the ebb and flow of energy, musical conversation, the layers, a mood and feeling, memories that get triggered, and visual images that come to mind. We're going to start part two with songs of Stephen Paulus from his cycle Art Songs, which was a co-commission with the Schubert Club and tenor Paul Sperry for the centennial of the Schubert Club. Stephen wrote, The purpose in selecting these particular poems was twofold. On the surface, I wanted each poem to make a comment about a well-known work of art. Additionally, I wanted each poem to provide the listener with something to reflect upon. In some cases, the result is a moment of humor or wit. In others, the painting serves only as a point of departure to provide the poet with an opportunity to delve into deeper thoughts and feelings. We'll listen to two songs in this cycle, The Dance and More Swan, performed here by the premiering and commissioning artists Paul Sperry and Irma Vallecillo. The dancers go round and round. The dancers go round and round. Go round. The squeal of the blare and the tweedle of bagpipes. A bugle and fiddles tipping the bellies. Round as the thick sided glasses whose wash they impound. Their hips and their bellies are balanced to turn them. Kicking and rolling about the fairgrounds, swinging their butts, the shanks must be sound to bear up under such rollicking measures. Grants as they dance, grants as they dance. The dancers go round and round. The dancers go round and round. Go round. Splotches on my back. 
my next We've got a rather unusual work by the Pulitzer Prize-winning composer Ned Roram up next. Ned Roram is known mostly as a miniaturist. He has over 500 songs and has written some chamber music as well. And um, rather strangely, he won the Pulitzer the year after Argento won it in 1976 for an orchestral suite that he wrote. Um, We're going to listen to the final movement of his work, Nine Episodes for Four Players. Um, Rorm had lost his longtime partner to AIDS in 1999, and the enormous amount of time devoted in care and worry exhausted him and decreased his productivity as a composer. The offer extended by the Contrasts Quartet, which commissioned the work along with the Soli Chamber Ensemble, the Schubert Club's Music in the Park series, and the Pacific Serenades, was part of a reawakening of composition to Ned Rorum. This is his final movement of nine episodes for four players. Thank you. 
Next, we'll learn about one of the most significant commissions of the Schubert Club, and that is the Song Cycle by Dominic Argento, which won the Pulitzer Prize in 1975 from the Diary of Virginia Woolf. I'd like to share with you the preface which Dominic wrote in his published edition of the work, which gives us a direct sightline into a milestone for our artistic community. Dominic writes, Bruce Carlson, manager of the Schubert Club, booked soprano Jessie Norman for a recital in 1974 and commissioned me to write a cycle for her. By the time I had searched for and found a suitable text to fit her unique talents, excerpts from Sappho, she had canceled. I learned that she was going to be replaced with Beverly Sills, for whom I felt Sappho was unsuited. Instead, I thought to compose something actressy, perhaps a gallery of Shakespearean heroines, Ophelia, Cleopatra, and so on. I can't remember why Sills also had to cancel, but to my good fortune, she was replaced with British mezzo Janet Baker. For Janet, both Sappho and actressy were plainly wrong. Bob Moore, a friend of ours in the English department at the university and a great fancier of female voices, suggested the interludes describing the gradual rise of the sun over the sea's horizon in Virginia Woolf's The Waves. Wanting to know more about Woolf's intentions in the use of that image, I looked up a writer's diary. As soon as I began reading, it struck me that the diary itself was more interesting than Bob's original idea. The hardest part was picking which entries to use. I reduced my favorite but unwieldy dozen down to eight and arranged them chronologically from the earliest to the final entry, spacing the others in between about five years apart. The finished score was sent off to Boozy, the publisher, and both Baker and her accompanist, Martin Isop, received a copy of it months before the date of the premiere. However, both were touring independently in different parts of Europe and North America, and they had had no opportunity to go over the piece together until they arrived in Minneapolis Thursday evening before the Sunday afternoon recital. They worked Friday and Saturday and requested that I not attend any rehearsals until Sunday morning. When I arrived at the brand new orchestra hall that Sunday morning, I was introduced to Janet and Martin, and they asked if they should go through one song at a time and then discuss it, or sing this cycle straight through. I said I preferred having them do the entire thing first without any interruptions from me. When they had finished, I was speechless, utterly flabbergasted. It was perfection. Two days before, they had never done the piece, and now I had just heard a performance that to this day has never been surpassed. Even the premiere that afternoon was not quite as good as that first run-through. Janet asked me to come up and give them my criticism. I went on stage and said, I have nothing to tell you except that I am a blubbering mass of gratitude and I will never be able to thank you enough. I took my leave and let them go on to rehearse the rest of the program alone. Unbeknownst to them, the engineer, who was setting balances and microphone placements to tape the recital for a later radio broadcast, was surreptitiously recording the rehearsal. Janet is distinctly heard on that tape whispering to Martin as I walked off stage, What a lovely man! That following April, weeks before the Pulitzers were announced, Hugo Weisgo phoned. Inside information had it that Wolf had won. I didn't believe him. A week later, Stuart Pope at Boozy called to say he, too, had heard the rumor. I still didn't believe it. He promised he would phone at 5 Minneapolis time the morning the New York Times published the winners' names. On the eve of announcement day, I sat by the phone all night, unable to sleep, reading Will Durant's story of philosophy. At 5, nothing. At 6, nothing. By 8, still nothing. Convinced I hadn't won, I went to bed. Soon after 9 a.m., the phone rang. I no longer remember what had delayed them, but Stewart said yes, it was true. Wolf had won. I feel a little sorry for the composer residing in New York City, Los Angeles, or some comparable megapolis winning a Pulitzer. No doubt a substantial amount of publicity is received, but being awarded the prize in Minneapolis created a virtual blitzkrieg of media attention. By noon, vans from the four local TV stations were parked in front of our house with long black cables snaking across a small patch of lawn, onto the porch, in through the open front door, up a staircase on which half a dozen radio and newspaper reporters, plus stringers for the AP and UPI, were jostling for position. 
and into my second floor studio where unimaginative videographers insisted on filming me seated at the piano, pencil in hand, focusing on a sheet of music manuscript, pretending to be composing. I have never understood their fondness for this pose. It always reminds me of a safari-suited, pilf-helmeted hunter cradling a rifle in his arms, with one foot resting lightly on an elephant's carcass. That following morning, during a tremendous downpour, our doorbell rang, and Carolyn, my wife, answered to find our postman in slicker and plastic-protected cap, rain streaming off his visor, down his glasses, face, chin, holding a tall stack of soggy letters, cards, and mailgrams. Smiling but bemused, he handed her the pile and said, I guess this means he's going to be famous. We are going to listen to that Sunday afternoon premiere public performance now. These are two of the diary entries with song titles Anxiety and Parents with Dame Janet Baker and Martin Isip.
contemporary, I shall lose my child's vision. And so must stop. Nothing turbulent, nothing involved, no introspection. We'll finish out part two with one of the most recent commissions of the Schubert Club by former composer in residence and host of the courtroom concerts, Abby Bettinas. Her work, Rhapsodos, was a joint commission in 2016 with the Minnesota and Seattle Commissioning Clubs and had its premiere at the Schubert Club's International Artist Series at the Ordway Concert Hall. We'll get to relive that premiere performance, but first, here is Abby to lead us into her work. This new rhapsody is inspired by the performers of Greek epic poetry in the 4th and 5th centuries BC. The word rhapsody comes from the Greek word meaning to sew songs together, rhapsodine. And the rhapsodist, um, or in Greek you'd call it the rhapsodos, was like a singing storyteller, standing with a long staff in front of an eager crowd and performing memorized snippets of stories from the great epic poets, one after the next, telling long, varied tales of adventure. Some rhapsodists became quite famous, uh, traveling many miles to sing night after night, not so different from our concert recitalists today. The rhapsodists took their rhythm from epic poetry's dactylic hexameter, so that's strong, weak, weak, strong, weak, weak, and for their melodies, they exaggerated the original Greek accents in the language into a kind of speech-driven music. As I researched the strict performance practice, I wondered if the musical essence of those tales would still delight our contemporary ears, even with the words themselves stripped away. Would those melodies really sing? Using fragments from Homer's uh, epic tale, of course, the Odyssey, I let the original Greek verse uh, suggest both the rhythmic accents and the melodic contour of the clarinet part. In fact, if you happen to know the opening lines of the epic poem in Greek, you could theoretically be able to sing right along with Michael Collins's clarinet. The piano paints the context and the emotion of the stories. The shifting sea, Penelope's loom, uh, memories of home, you'll hear that little mandolin kind of sound as he dreams of home. Like all epic poems, the performance opens with an invocation to the muse. Oh, muse, let our stories begin. And then you hear Odysseus in all of his tales of adventure. You might hear him dodging arrows or calling back to his dying comrades or uh, there's a thick glissandi of the lotus eaters uh, the shriek of the Cyclops when Odysseus escapes. Whatever the music suggests to you, I hope it takes you on an adventure and that it might somehow connect us to those who, like us, sat together listening to the master storytellers sewing songs together thousands of years ago.
And that will conclude our exploration of the commissions of the Shubrick Club. This, of course, is such a huge topic, so I hope we'll have an opportunity to continue exploring in another session. I do hope that this session, however, has maybe introduced you to a work you hadn't heard or introduced you to a composer you hadn't met yet. Either way, remember that there's no wrong time or wrong way to commission a composer to write a new piece of music. Until next time at the Listening Circle, we'll see you soon.